Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. I'm Gary Pauland, and this week my co-host is Barbara Radnofsky. Again, welcome, Barbara. I love being here. Thank and you. I like your scarf. I like your tie. Thank you, dear. This week's guest is Lena Hidalgo, the new county judge for Harris County, and we're honored to have her here. Welcome, Judge Hidalgo. Is that that's how we're supposed to address you? Is that correct? Oh, thank Your you honor. so much for right. <laughs> think, you can call me Lena, but thank you so much for having me on well, the show. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your victory, which is it was significant. You know, you were the one of the, all the Democrats in this county who stood up and said, "I'm going to take on Ed Emmett. I don't think he's unbeatable. I think with the right campaign, with what I bring to the table, I can win." And you were right. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I was one of many, a lot of people who hadn't participated in the past, who never thought they would run, not just in our county, but, but nationally. And so I can't take credit for that. It's really folks who participated, voted for the first time, volunteered for the first time, ran for the first time. So I want to say I was part of something bigger. Um, and I'm very, very grateful to everybody. Ultimately, I'm county judge for everyone, and I couldn't be more thrilled to be in this position now and able so to serve my fun? community. So you having fun? Are you having fun? Yes. It's <laughs> been, you know, it's been a lot of work. We've been focused. We're trying to be thoughtful and decisive at the same time. So, you know, coming in and running a, a parallel tracks, how do we take a deep look at where we're headed and make sure that we're being careful and that we've got a path forward in a direction and a goal on each of the different issue areas and at the same time address the issues that are pressing. So we've been focused on building, you know, a star team, uh, identifying what are the low hanging fruit, what are the things we need to move on right now, and then setting long term priorities, which um, for me really was coming in, you know, safety and that includes flood control, safety from flooding criminal justice reform because so much of our budget goes to that and, and it's just ripe for opportunity, not just here, but nationally. Um, and ultimately, you know, transparency to me, it's at the heart of everything and it's part of the movement, this desire for participation that seems to be going on all over the country. Well, you mentioned flooding, which is a major issue, as you know, in Harris County. And we've had, what, these hundred year flood events, what is it, Barbara, every three or four years? Yeah, it seems, four yeah, we think they're now five year flood events yeah. and not hundred year, but it's a problem. Uh, the county commissioners, some of which are still your colleagues, uh, brought before the public in August a, a massive bond issue to kind of jumpstart programs to, to, to save the, the most of the people they can in the county from future flooding events because we know they're coming. So uh, does that in line with your priorities in terms of going forward with the plans that they've made uh, to spend money effectively on projects to reduce flooding for, for everybody? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's the number one issue, part of safety. So right now, um, they've staffed up the Harris County Flood Control District, the new building, making sure that we have the capacity to move all of these projects forward. We're moving forward in particular with the projects that have federal matching funds. So the um, Army Corps projects, for example, hunting, braise, Clear Creek, uh, White Oak bayous. Those are, you know, dirt ready to turn. Uh, we're on phase two of hunting bayou. We just learned today, actually on my way here, I got an email that on the Clear Creek project, the federal government has allowed us, Harris County, to take the lead. And we are much faster. We've got a stellar team. And that means that that project can get done in you know two years instead of four, much faster than if the federal government were to take it. And so, and those are some of the funds that could be threatened if the federal government tries to take Army Corps dollars. So we're focused on that, you know, dredging uh, San Jacinto, uh, focused on dredging and also clearing up some of the sediment in Addicts and Barker buyouts we have buyout areas of interest all across the county so buying out some of those homes and then thinking very carefully about everything that's coming down the pipeline so i'm still wrapping my head around everything that's moving and i run into folks in the community all the time explain to me you know just just give me some big picture as to what's going where which funds are coming when where are they going and why and so one of the things we passed at the first core that we're working on and, and, and very close to being done hopefully a matter of weeks for the first phase is a transparency dashboard that shows the funds where they're coming why they haven't arrived yet it it's ultimately it's you know just procedural issues with the federal government but making that clear and and trying to paint a picture for folks on where we are and where we're going um, aside from that we've got a billion dollars that we just received through hud housing dollars that are being dispersed through our community services department and those are for um, repair and reconstruction of homes 
also for buyouts, uh, renters assistant to try and, you know, place them somewhere else if they need to move, all sorts of housing type support. And that project is available right now, harrisrecovery.org is where folks can go in with the pre-application and we're doing the full launch starting in March. Harrisrecovery.org. Harrisrecovery.org. And so folks can begin submitting their application. If you, you know, just apply, the city's got a similar program. And so, but if you apply through Harris County, we'll refer you to the city and vice versa. Um, and it's for folks that are still rebuilding after Harvey. And then we've got uh, low hanging fruit, what I call it, and I'm looking at with the Office of Emergency Management and Flood Control. So what can we do? For example, we're looking at barriers to protect from, um, protect folks from driving into underpasses when it's flooding. We're looking at uh, a push notification that goes out to folks, you know, that you know that, that, that the reservoir or the bayou is, is, that the water is reaching its banks. Um, you know, how do we better collaborate across the different players, nonprofits, et cetera. I was there, I think it was January 2nd, second day, first day, I think at the office, we had seven inches of rain and I was at the Office of Emergency Management uh, trying to deal with that because during the transition, I was studying up and getting to meet all the partners. And right now it's learning and just being ready to address an emergency, to get this, these funds moving and to do it transparently and openly, openly so that the community knows what's happening. Yeah, information certainly is, is important. And so hopefully these flood control projects will move fast uh, and forward effectively. So when we have the next uh, heavy rain, we'll yeah. be ready. You, you campaigned on a promise of openness and transparency and listening to people. It has, how's that working? It's been great. So we, we tried out an experiment. We said, let's see what happens if we open the transition process up to the community. So we created this uh, with the support from, from the Ford Foundation, the Houston Endowment, Episcopal Health Foundation. We've put together these uh, Civic Saturdays, part of a talking transition. And so it is, uh, we're doing a survey sending it all around the county. We've got canvassers that are, that are sending the, the, taking the survey around, asking folks about different issue areas, what they'd like to see in the community, what would encourage them to participate more with county government. And then we're doing seven events, seven different Saturdays across the county on seven different issue areas. We've had two, and that was really the experiment. You know, will folks show up? Are they interested? And how's it, how is the that working? The first one, we had around 200 people, just over 200 people, two weeks ago. This past Saturday, we did the one on, that one was on health and the environment. This past Saturday was on transportation. We did in Gulfton. The first one was in Pasadena. And um, this last one, over 500 folks showed up. Okay. And so it's a community discussion. And then we have a discussion with folks that have been working on these issues, thought leaders for a long time. And the conversation is, not, is so much, you know, we already know the issues. We sort of know the solution. How do we begin working on implementing? How do we build partnerships with the county and with all the different players? Because frankly, a lot of these issues, they're not issues I can move along by myself. I need my colleagues on the court. We need different areas of government. We need the nonprofit and the private sector. And so let Let's work together on this, um, and it's been it's been heartening. So it's been very exciting to see the community participate, to see the community come to our commissioners' court meetings, and all of what we're learning will be compiling, will be putting out and sharing, and will be incorporating into our policy priorities. Let's ask about the commissioners' court meetings. Eight um, hours. I, yeah. we, we both. I think we both have a great interest in long meetings. What's uh, what's the story on that? So we're working on that one. So yes, you know, we said, well, well let's, um, let's open these up to the community. For too long, county government has been something folks don't really, you know, feel and, and that they don't feel a relationship to. And, and it's my belief that you can't hold government accountable if you don't understand it, if you don't know it's there and you don't know what it does. So the idea was let's make these more open. And what I've tried to do is try to explain as we go along what these meetings mean. Now, we've had so many speakers that they've gone on for hours and hours. Yeah. Um, and, and the truth is, you know, there's a quote, I think it's a Churchill quote, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Uh -huh. So it is messy, um, but we're tweaking it. So we're working with our colleagues and at the staff level to figure out, you know, could we have a consent agenda? 
Could we have um, a day in which folks come and speak and then another one in which the court decides what might be a good way to address uh, this so that we, we don't, you know, maybe having eight hours, me eight hour meetings doesn't work for folks because some folks can't wait eight hours to speak. But certainly we don't want to go back to the days in which we had 20 minute or hour long meetings in which we were discussing, you know, four and five hundred million dollar allocations. Um, so it's a balance. We're working on it. But what we're seeing is there is a desire, there is a thirst for participation and oversight over this body that ultimately, you know, we just allocated uh, just over five billion dollars for the next fiscal year. And we owe it to the community to do that openly. Well, the city council has what they call a pop off session, uh, which is not during a, it's a separate meeting as opposed mm -hmm. to their business meeting where people have a chance to sign up and speak on whatever they want to talk about. So that may be an idea that would be effective. But you're right, there's a balance between a 20 minute meeting where everything was actually decided in executive session and uh, an eight hour meeting where some people are droning on on stuff that is really not relevant to what you're working on. But so I think there's you may be seeing, are you seeing new people? I mean, do you f get the feel that between the combination of more public impact or information given in your meetings and having the Saturday sessions, are you seeing more people than was than were participating in all sorts our of messy new democracy? people? It's incredible. I mean, all sorts of new people. Of course, there are some, you know, repeats that come to court. But for the most part, I mean, it's incredible. And so that's what I don't want to stifle. And I've seen in the past, you know, it's like an issue folks are so passionate about. You've got 50 people ready to speak and somehow they have to squeeze themselves into 15 minutes. That's not democratic. You know, I've, I've seen and, and lived and worked in closed countries. And I know that transparency, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And so it's about how we make it accessible. Um, and we're working on it and we're working out the kinks. Um, but it, it's beautiful to see folks come along in this, this new way of doing things that truly allows for participation and I think ultimately builds better government. Um, we have some great ideas that we didn't, you know, it, it hadn't occurred to us. And so to have folks, um, thought leaders and folks who are living these issues on a day-to-day -day basis come participate and want to be a part of this, take time out of their lives. And some to of help your critics, better too, government. I imagine. And I welcome them. Okay. Um, so, of course, and we, critics. you know, we, 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 <laughs> we, we're learning. And I'm getting to know, I want folks to know me who don't know me yet. I want to know about the issues perhaps I'm still learning about. Um, but that's part of the process, you know. That's part of what makes our, our democracy what it is. Yeah, that, that's good to have people come in and give their insight because you never know when it, where a good idea will come from. That's right. the truth. I let you talked about criminal justice being important, and one of the things that the commissioner's court did and you supported was to expand the public defender and basically tell the DA's office to go stuff it. And uh, there's a lot of concern. I'm, I, I, mean, I, would, I wouldn't characterize right. it that way. But you voted no. Okay, uh -huh. and, I, and there's concern, and there's concern. Uh, there's been a survey done. I'm sure you're aware of it. Uh, per capita spending by county prosecutors' offices of the major cities in America or counties in America were last. I mean, not even close. Uh, New York City or New York County, seventy-six dollars uh, per per capita spending in Houston's nineteen dollars and twelve cents. We're behind twenty major cities, so we're not sp or counties. So we're not spending the resources we need. Added to that, the DA's office, it, based on the way I have observed it, and I work down there. Uh, suffered the biggest brunt in terms of their efforts from what happened with Harvey, because they were dislocated from their offices, they were dislocated from their courts, they were gypsies, they were in this place, they were in that place, they're now in office space downtown. Uh, they desperately needed additional prosecutors to move the backlog. And that's not just the backlog of talking about prosecuting the cases, it's evaluating cases for diversion, which I know you're a big supporter of, as am I, that's important to do, or to evaluate cases to whether or not they should be dismissed or not because they're not, they don't have what they need to go forward. They need the resources to do it. You add it to that, you compare the number of caseload per, per prosecutor with what the public defender does. Public defender's average caseload is about 80, 90, 100 cases. The DA's office, the average DA has over 600 cases. And it's almost impossible to do your job. And we also don't pay them that great. Public defender makes significantly more money per, per attorney than the DA's office does because the DA's office has entry level lawyers who start at quite low level. So it is a big problem and the commissioner's court voted no, three to two I believe, not to give her the resources, not even give her some of the resources, which I, I have trouble with and a lot of people have trouble with. 
remember, and I'm, I'm an adversary with the DA's office. I represent citizens accused of crimes, but I also recognize they got to have the resources to do their job. Yeah. And if they mm -hmm. don't, you have a problem with it takes longer and longer for them to review a case. For example, I had a case, I had a case, I had an aggravated sexual assault of a child case involving a juvenile. And because they're so overworked, it took them a couple of settings to evaluate the information that I had provided to indicate that my client wasn't guilty, okay? If they were staffed the way they should have, I could have done that done in one setting. And unfortunately, during that period, my client was in detention because he had had a prior felony as a juvenile. And so the judges had kept him in detention, which is probably the right thing to do given the serious nature of the charge. Case ultimately gets dismissed, but is delayed because they don't have the resources they need. So I'm here as a citizen with an opinion and is informed to tell you it's a big mistake not to give the DA's office the resources they need to do their job. And, and that is, and in fact, in reviewing what's happened under Og, Og has done a terrific job if you believe in diversion, if you believe in decriminalization of marijuana and other things that you're familiar with, Barbara. She's done a great job in that. And, and, and the idea, which I think you agree with, Lena, we want them to prosecute the really serious offenses. You know, rapes, yeah. robberies, murders, aggravated assaults, wife beatings, things like that. Those are things very important to prosecute, but if you don't have the resources, you don't have the personnel, you cannot do it. Right. So what we did in the last core, what you're referring to is we approved the budget for the next fiscal year. And the question is, you know, what should each department get? Um, and we take very seriously that being fiscally responsible. Um, so what fundamentally we've got issues in our criminal justice system. We used to have the largest mental health facility, not just in the state, but probably in the nation. Yeah, and the I think yeah. Cook, Cook County surpassed that. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got deep issues with overcrowding in the jail. We've got folks uh, waiting in jail because there's not a courtroom for trial. Um, we've got deep disparities. Um, and we know that something is broken. So. What we were being asked to do was to, to invest $20 million annually to increase uh, the budget, the DA's budget, by a substantial amount. And we thought, you know, $20 million in perpetuity for 102 new prosecutors is a, an incredibly important investment. And before we do that, we have to make sure that that is getting to the core of the issues in our criminal justice system. What we heard from a lot of academics is, for example, um, caseloads. You mentioned caseloads. There's a study, a Gershowitz study, that a lot of folks have referred and referred to about, you know, prosecutors, it's important for them to have uh, adequate caseloads. The solution, the study says, is not necessarily more prosecutors. It might be more support staff. It might be a better systems. And so that's the issue we want to look at. We can't hire 102 new folks, then they'll be there forever. And so the question is, and what we decided to do is we gave the DA a 7% increase in her budget, which is $5.8 million. Everybody got that in the county. Everybody got a 5% mil a five percent okay, increase. 2%. And, um, but her budget is already much larger than anybody else's. But not and compared she to had, her um, colleagues around the country. Excuse me? not compared to our colleagues around the country. So it depends on how you measure it. It's not necessarily a per capita because around the country, we incarcerate, the U.S. incarcerates more people than any other country on earth. We spend so many funds on this in, in, a, in a way that is not productive. So what are we comparing ourselves to? So what we decided is we're bringing in an outside group to evaluate our justice system. And if they say the way to address overcrowding and disparities and the mental health issues is to bring 102 new prosecutors, I'll be the first one to do it. But for now, I just want to make those responsible investments. And I, and I understand um, that. That so makes that's, sense. So that's where we landed. And, and Kim Ogg is a, a, a friend, an incredible person who's done a great job with her office. Um, and so we said, you know, she got the, the 7%. Um, she got a new building, $3 million last year, $3 million also um, for some of her supplies. Otherwise, they'd be on the street. Excuse well, uh, me? No, no. Let's talk about, let's talk about buildings because no. I've had well, that, a deep would, interest. Well, I, we'll get to that. I, okay. I want to finish with this topic. Okay. I have more to follow. I understand what you're saying. Evaluate the system. What do we need to do to spend the money to be effective in terms of rehabilitating people we can rehabilitate, in terms of diverting people we can divert, idea that they don't come back in the system. That's, you are spot on. So if that's the case, 
Why did you give the big increase to the public defender? That's not any different than looking at the prosecutor in the same way. The public defender's answer, I guess, is, well, if we have more public defenders, we can get more people off. That's not necessarily true, any more than more prosecutors guarantee, like you just said. So to be consistent, you ought to not have increased anyone beyond the 7% well, and let done me your ask study. You something. This is really for so, both of you. So, let yes. me ask you. Yeah. Are you saying that we shouldn't have defense for people who can't afford it? So I think Maybe we're kind no. of we're kind of overlapping. You know, it's a, it's a lot of different. So currently, you have uh, on the indigent defense side, so many folks can't afford an attorney, and the public defender's office is only large enough to take eight percent of cases. They get much better outcomes. So you know, that, the folks the way, that have uh, that the is folks, not true. That which is not true. Which part that of they it? get better outcomes. That so is not let me, true. So let me finish this Compare them with the so Fair the, Defense the, Act lawyers. They do not get better well, outcomes. Well, it's, it's hard if we can't go one at a time. Let me, let me, let me finish my, my, uh, my, my reasoning here because I do think it's important to share with folks you know, what we were thinking as we voted for this. And, um, and it's that if you look at the court-appointed attorneys, the dismissal rates, for example, for a mental health case are 30% lower than a public defender's office. The new judges that have come in, they want to use the public defender, but they can't because the public defenders doesn't have enough capacity. There are caseload standards for the defense attorneys. Um, there are no caseload standards for prosecutors. All the studies have said that is a that is a jurisdiction by jurisdiction thing. If you talk to the academics, you just cannot define caseload standards for prosecutors because so much of it can be done by the support staff and you know th there's it's work that you do also with law enforcement. And so it's it's apples and oranges. Um, and so in this sense, again, you know, if we'd done a, a, a 7% increase of the um, public defender's office, it would have been $800,000. DA, 5.7 million, right? And so it, we're, we're basically trying to meet this demand that we're having with the bail reform that's coming down the pipeline. We have to make sure we do it right because everybody's watching us. And with the demand that the um, judges have been asking for because they're trying to refer more cases to the public defender and they simply don't have the staff. Um, so we're, we're, you know, they're in <clears throat> extreme small stage and we're trying to get them somewhere. Right now they'll only be able to take about 20% of cases, but they're part of the system-wide review. And, and the bigger thing I want to say is we're really looking at our criminal justice system holistically and we've got the opportunity of a lifetime to do that, to look at how we change things all together because you can tweak here, you can tweak there, and even what we did with that budget, that's not going to solve the issues. You know, we're looking at how we how we get the system moving. Given that after Harvey, some uh, you know that courthouse flooded, what do we do? There that are so many that's moving pieces, question. and so that's why we said let's bring somebody from the outside, look at all of it, and help us go just get in the right direction. So you're going to look at the building yeah. issue. You're going to look at yeah. the entirety of it, which is we're talking we rebuild, gazillions of we dollars. Should we remodel it? So all of those are going into one big analysis. Yes. The, so on the building, we put together, we brought together a set of stakeholders to talk about, and the charge we sent them is a, a you know. The building flooded after Harvey. Twice. Um, it had Two flooded. Yeah. It had flooded already during yeah. Allison, and so we we've brought together representatives from different stakeholders, and we said, okay, we've got two sets of questions. One is the long-term issue. Do we rebuild this courtroom, this courthouse that some folks have said wasn't built right in the first place? Mm. They're absolutely right, by the or, way. Or right, it's or garbage. do we, or do, <laughs> do Sorry, we, you do we it. fix it? We right. Agree. That's kind of the long-term question, mm -hmm. and the short-term okay. question is for now. Folks aren't being able to settle their trial, you know, to settle their cases because yeah, they can't settle the trials. Idea. So, so yeah, they gave exactly. us. Everyone agreed, you know, unanimous agreement That's on right. the interim solution, which was let's open up some courthouses and fix courtrooms and fix mm -hmm. some elevators. Long-term solution. The group is still working on on that solution, and I hope that they can, because there are differences of opinion, sure that is. they can come with one, bring it to commissioner's court. We're trying to give them all the resources they need. We need to go an hour. Um, to come up with something. Did you, have yeah. you been to that building? Yeah. So it was designed, you know, understand, it was designed by architects, your predecessors, not your responsibility, who designed office buildings. It's not designed as a courthouse. 
It's totally dysfunctional. The feng shui in the building is way off. And there's probably other it's, things bad. It's so ch and the balance we're trying to do is, is, is that and what's the alternative? Idea, but it is, yeah. exactly. You're, we're impressing, yeah. you're impressive in your willingness oh, like to that. look at it all. I'm, I'm impressed. We, well, agree. I hope, we agree. I hope they'll, they'll, they'll bring something back. And <laughs> it's, and, so. it, and it's yeah. all the different sides and budget and the engineer and, and, and try and bring something back to commissioner's court. So there, I'm agnostic. I really, we all want our system moving. I know it's going to be challenging for folks to agree uh, on what they want the solution to be, and, and I hope they'll bring something back, and back. if not, you yeah, know, we'll, we'll just have to decide it. All right, two other, two other yeah. points I want to make. Mm -hmm. There's a shortage of leg monitors for the probation department and for juvenile courts in terms of releasing people on their own recognizance. Just to throw out that for you, we need to address that so we don't have to wait. It's kind of like waiting for beds for alternative programs for people who are diverting for drugs, mental health, or whatever in the probation system. We got to make sure we have and the know beds know that we we've got a group of stakeholders working on our bail reform implementation. And so they've already identified, for example, they need another box in the system that they can check. So we added the box. And so when they come with needs like these, there's a path and the, the commissioners each have a representative in this group for them to come to commissioner's court and say, we need leg monitors. I mean, right now right. we're I'm at the center. You know. I'm just letting you know, no, informational. But it, it's, it's important. And we are listening to how do we make sure that as we're implementing the reform that was ordered right. by a federal judge, Republican appointed judge, that our system right. was so discriminatory, our bail system, so discriminatory as it to be unconstitutional. How do we implement the reform in the right way? Exactly. So we need, we need that. In addition, there's been a study done on a new detention center for two years in juvenile. They need it. I know you're going to look at it. That pretty much wraps things up. I'm, I'm sorry to say, Lena, we could have gone an hour, Judge. We could have gone an hour with you. Very informative. I mean, I think you're off to a really good start. Loved having you. And we'll, we'll be happy most to have you. If you. If you had a good enough time that you'll come back and trust us to ask you some tough questions, we'd love to have you back to continue to talk about as these answers start coming forward with the studies that you are doing. Thank We'd love you. to have Please. you. Yes, I'm so happy to be here. And I do want to mention our talking transition continues. You know, for, we have five more weeks, and it's talkingtransition.us. And they can find out where to go. Can find visit. out where to go, fill out the talking survey. I did the transition. survey. I did the survey. Thank you. Online. There you go. So talking, there you go. Everyone so talking you do it. Transition. Did, you? Dot US. did you do it? And we'll, no. we'll be having, there you go, Barbara. So the next you one's in Baytown. It'll be about resilience. Yeah, okay, I will um, go to talkingtransition.us. Please, but please join us and, and join us at court, well, at Commissioner's Court on Tuesday. Okay. Well, we have to take the show. You know, we're, we work here. All right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> folks keep, again, we're, yeah. we're, thank you so much for coming thank you. on Red, White, and Blue. I hope you had a good time. You know, we'll have to ask your staff if you thought we were fair with you. Yeah. Not long we enough. Will. We'll be back. Yes, no, thank a half you. hour okay. goes really fast. So, yeah. Barbara, that's week. Th thank you for being a guest host this week. I've enjoyed having Me too. having you around. Look forward to seeing you in the future. Folks, we'll be back, back next week with another exciting newsmaker on Red, White, and Blue.